Okay. So thank you for taking the time today. First of all, could you please just uh, say and spell your name? Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm Peter Salovey, P-E-T-E-R-S-A-L-O-V-E-Y. Great. And can you uh, give me just, and you can be as elaborate as you want to, um, give me a brief autobiographical sketch of your own kind of travels through the world of higher education, sure. the kinds of places you've been, the, the posts that you've held. Sure. My, my uh, um, pathway is uh, uh, not all that complicated. Uh, I was a graduate of public uh, high school in uh, Los Angeles, although mostly attended public high school in Buffalo, suburbs of Buffalo, New York. We moved in the middle. Uh, and then I went to Stanford, uh, was completely attracted by great teaching in the psychology department. And uh, although I thought I was going, I thought I was going to be a kind of math and science kid. Those were my strongest subjects. But I also loved theater. So that, I, that, that was what I sort of thought I was going to do in college. And then uh, did end up doing a lot of science and theater. But the teaching and psychology uh, and sociology were so compelling that it kind of attracted me, uh, even though they were not areas that I had ever studied in high school. Um, I worked for a year after college uh, in a, um, for a group in Silicon Valley that taught communication skills in, uh, Silicon Valley wasn't really Silicon Valley in 1980, but uh, we went into companies like Xerox and Apple in the early days and taught communications, which for me personally was mostly, a, I was a writing teacher. And uh, that, got, that sort of got me excited about teaching and uh, enjoyed teaching writing. Uh, came to Yale for graduate school in psychology, was in the PhD program in clinical psychology, which actually, although it educates you to be a scientist, you also get clinical training and can practice. But when I came out, I was much more of a social psychologist studying interpersonal behavior and really went on the job market for academic jobs in social psychology. Um, interviewed in a number of places and had a number of opportunities. The job market in psychology is academic psychology wasn't bad then and continues not to be bad. It's one of the areas where I think in part because there's also non-academic options where, where the academic employment is still uh, obtainable by those who want it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I got offered a job here at Yale to stay at Yale. And I thought hard about whether I wanted to teach where I had been a graduate student. And it is not the tradition in psychology to do that at all. But the department was in a rebuilding phase. And I thought, well, you know, let, let's, let's stay. And uh, my wife uh, does urban uh, public health and was working in Hartford at the time. So it, from a family point of view, it worked, worked out better. The, um, joined the faculty and, and uh, got on what passed for a tenure track at, at Yale at that time. And uh, fully expected not to stay, not to stay long term. Uh, my department had not tenured many people from within. Uh, the, the, I started in, in I started on the faculty in '86, and the last case had been in the late '70s. And um, it, you know, we, we, the expectation was you weren't going to stay. Uh, it, it worked out, and. Uh, a few years after, so I was tenured, I served as the director of graduate studies for many of those years after I was tenured. Enjoyed, it was interesting, I enjoyed teaching undergraduates. I taught the introductory psychology course for many years uh, and really tried to model the great teaching that attracted me to psychology. Viewed it, viewed teaching as not really filling buckets, but very much as lighting fires. Uh, my goal was to get students who never thought they were going to take another psychology course to think about taking another psychology course. And I almost didn't care if they remembered names, dates, and, mm -hmm. and that just wasn't, wasn't for me the issue. I did want them to learn how to think the way a psychologist thinks, which is different. Uh, you know, it's empirically oriented field. It is a positivist uh, a mindset. And, um, you know, what does that mean? And also, what are its limitations? Um, as the um, senior generation in my department began to retire, uh, I, I was sort of on the front end of the younger generation and, and was asked to chair my department in 2000. Um, that was the first time I ever gave any thought to academic leadership. 
Uh, chairing the department was a lot of fun because we were rebuilding, we were hiring. Uh, there was also many things to fix that didn't require, I, I hate the phrase, but they were low-hanging fruit. Uh, we could fix them. You know, how could we have a more attractive seminar room? Uh, how could we um, uh, put down on paper our expectations for graduate students? Um, how could we uh, have a hiring process that would most uh, that would maximize the chances that we would further diversify our faculty? That that one is not so low hanging. That's a challenge. But but the idea was there were projects to work on immediately. It sort of jumped in and worked on them. About uh, two and a half years of chairing. Uh, and uh, dominoes started to fall on the Yale administration. Susan Hockfield moved, into, moved from the graduate school dean's office to the provost's office because Allison Richard became the provost, became vice rector at, uh, vice chancellor at uh, Cambridge. And all of a sudden, Rick Levin needed a dean of the graduate school. And he called me up and he said, um, you know, Peter, uh, uh, you're chairing the department. It seems to be going well. I need someone to step in pretty quickly. And uh, would you think about it? Well, it was December 24th, and he needed somebody for the spring semester. And I said to him, well, let me go home. We're closing up for the winter break. Let me go home, talk about it with my family. I'll come back when Yale reopens on January 3rd and give you an answer. And Rick said, why don't you go home and have lunch with Marta and come back at 2 o'clock and give me your answer? And so I did that. It said yes, and I can't say it was very planful, or mm -hmm. you know. And I decided I would try it. And what I found is that being a dean, um, and, and after deaning the grad school for 18 months, I was dean of the college for about four and a half years. Being a dean was a liberal education all over again. Uh, you know, I was in the hall of graduate studies at first, <laughs> with faculty from American studies and from history and from various language programs and, and, you know, just the random interactions in the hall, the occasionally dropping in on somebody's colloquium, it was eye-opening. And I realized that after all those years in psychology, which I loved and still love, um, I had become the kind of narrow academic that I never wanted to be. I wanted to be a generalist. I wanted to, I wanted to, be, I wanted to cross boundaries. And that, act, surprisingly, to be frank, being a dean, because there was so much interaction with scholars from so many fields that I didn't know anything about, that was that, that, was that re education and opportunity to become more of a generalist again. I kept my lab going, I still kept a few, uh, uh, continued to mentor students, graduate students, had a few undergraduates in my lab, and really up until becoming president, kept that all going. We were funded uh, by NIH. Uh, but I, but I kind of did that one day a week, and uh, and uh, uh, others, graduate students, postdocs, research faculty, kept it all going. Felt very generative, kind of mm -hmm. turning it over, but keeping it going, advising it instead of doing it in the trenches. Uh, and you know, I, I think anybody who is a serious academic who becomes an administrator feels that tension. You, you never fully resolve it, but but I, I was glad I could keep things going. Uh, became provost. Uh, when, uh, as I recall, two days before the, it, the it, crash, it was right? really amazing. Rick asked me to become provost in July. He asked me in July 2008 to start on October 1st, 2008, and September is when all hell broke loose. That was the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. That was the drop in the markets. We knew by the time I started on October 1st that there was going to have been serious damage done to our endowment. And as a result, our operating budget, since we spend five and a quarter percent of that endowment every year. And that being provost was not going to be the job I thought it was going to be. Uh, we, were, we were going to have to retrench, uh, or at least get through, manage through. And um, uh, essentially, that's what we did for four years. And um, it wasn't easy. It was rewarding in the sense that I look now. We're going to show a small surplus in our budget this year. We're going to show a, a nice gain in our endowment this year. We had a great fundraising year this year. The corner is turned. And, and we're going to have to be, I want to position us in a way that we'll never, never have an experience like that again, because we'll be prepared for it financially. Uh, and so that's going to, that's still going to require a kind of prudent mindset. 
but 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 I think we will have positioned the university now to to flourish to to um, uh, fund new initiatives to uh, run with the ball when we're handed it, mm -hmm. uh, but also to be a little bit better protected uh, should we ever have downdrafts again. We want to smooth it out. It shouldn't be such a roller coaster. Um, when I was asked to be president, um, uh, that that you know I got a call and and uh, asked if I wanted to be president by the senior fellow of the Yale Corporation. And he told me if I was going to say yes, if I said yes, they would announce it in three days. And so uh, obviously I had been thinking about it because I'd been interviewed uh, a number of times. Uh, but it become ve became very real at that point that um, I was going to have to think about Yale in a new way, in a much longer term and strategic way. And that the local issues of budget you know, uh, equilibrium were, you know, were now going to be behind us, uh, although I'd have to be part of that. Uh, and, uh, and I realized the job of president kind of has, it, in its simplest form, has three bullets. Uh, uh, and I always tell my uh, chief of staff, Joy McGrath, when you see me not working on those three bullets, you need to tell me. And those three bullets really are help in a collaborative way with faculty and other leaders um, develop and articulate the vision. What do we want to be? Second, hire the leadership team to do it, whether you're talking department chairs or deans or vice presidents, and then raise the money to carry it out. So it's really articulate the vision, hire the team, raise the money. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the day-to-day -day operations of the academic side of the university, the provost and the deans need to be doing with me, keeping an eye on it to make sure it's consistent with the vision that we've all agreed upon. That's very different than the rest, than anything else I've done before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I've only done it for a year. It's been very enjoyable. But in those three days that I had to decide, in those three days where I knew I was going to be president, but nobody else did except the board, I wrote down phrases. And I wrote down phrases like, how do we, how do we move toward a, a more unified yell that takes advantage of all of its parts and brings them together to create new areas of scholarship and teaching? How are we more innovative, but using innovative not in the narrow techie way that it's sometimes used, uh, but in everything that we do, even in the way in which we study the past, even in the way in which we preserve great collections? How can we be more innovative in how we think about that? Along with um, how do we spin off the great discoveries of our faculty and students into something that will help the world uh, how are we more accessible? I'm very interested in the, the debate, the contemporary debate on accessibility. We do that by offering very generous financial aid. You know, if you're at the median income level in this country or lower and you get admitted to Yale, you come with no parental contribution. I mean, that, that, you know, we are making Yale accessible financially. But it's impossible to get into this place. And most Students, most high school students who deserve a higher education and who higher education would change their lives uh, and would open up new vistas for them and would create some social mobility for them, you know, uh, uh, the Yale education is not available to them. So what else can we be doing to promote that? How do we promote education, not just education at Yale? I think the New Haven Promise is a great example of that, right? We are funding scholarships for students to go elsewhere if they come from New Haven Public Schools. I, I think that's about accessibility. So that's another thing. Uh, anyway, um, uh, so I started to talk about a more um, unified, innovative, accessible, and even more excellent Yale. Uh, and now in the second year, I have to move from themes to actually uh, operational mm -hmm. programs that will help us carry that out. We've done a lot of that in the first year too, but, but that's where we are for the second year. Anyway, uh, that's a long no, that's uh, trajectory, you. but... Uh, yeah, no, I, yeah. There are many things in there that I want to come back to. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. But first, I guess I'm curious... Um, Go ahead. I'm curious, in your view, what are the things in higher education... What are the most significant changes in yeah. the three or four decades that you've been around yeah, higher yeah, ed? Yeah. Um, um, there, I think there are many changes. I, I think um, uh, 
you know, the diversity in all senses of that word of our student body, uh, I think it leads to a far more exciting educational environment than was the case 30 years ago, but also means the university has to be ready for that diversity and support it. I, I think that's a big change. Um, I think um, graduate education is changing in the sense that um, in, in so many, f in, in scientific fields, graduate education is not the gateway to an academic career. There's all something in between this lengthy post -docking. People don't become independent scholars until they're well into their 40s. That's a huge change. On the humanities side of the university, also changes in terms of uh, opportunity to uh, become a scholar. Uh, you know, are, have always been um, uh, more limited that, than we might want them to be, but that pressure is not going away. I think all of that uh, it, it creates a context in which we need to be thinking hard about graduate education. Um, I think um, the way in which states are disinvesting in public education is changing higher education more generally. So states are looking to out-of-state students as um, uh, full tuition paying students. They're doing fundraising campaigns like uh, private universities. Um, I actually think um, the inability of the great the, 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 the great state universities always used to provide um, uh, opportunity for working in middle class students to get an education for not very much money. My you know my dad went to Bronx High School of Science and then went to City University of New York then called, well City College uh, at the time didn't pay a dime for either of those very high quality experiences. Uh, and you know, moved him out of poverty to middle class. Um, I think if the states are going to get out of the business of um, uh, uh, providing affordable education to middle and working class kids, what is Yale going to do? How is Yale? What is Yale's responsibilities? Uh, I think we're. I think the aggressiveness of our financial aid in recent years, and Harvard's, and Princeton's, and Stanford's is in part a response to that. Other changes, I'll mention two other changes. I, there's so, you know, we can go on like this, but I'll mention two other things. There's so many others you could mention. Um, <clears throat> I would say one is the expectations of parents and students about what a higher education is all about have changed. And there's a, t there's a, a kind of commodification and customer orientation. Uh, I, on the one hand, I don't mind uh, students and parents sort of saying, I want you to think about hard issues in education and kind of putting a little pressure on us to do the best we can. I don't mind that. I don't mind uh, parents and students putting pressure on us to say, why, why yell as opposed to somewhere else? But, um, you know, there is a, an orientation around uh, kind of customer orientation that is problematic too. You know, we are, we are uh, educating the next generation of leaders for the world. We are creating citizens. We are creating uh, people who will enjoy the life of the mind, who will have different kind of lives. And uh, some of that require the customer orientation where if, if our job is give customers what they want when they enter here, we're not going to accomplish that mission uh, very well. Uh, sometimes an 18-year-old doesn't know what they don't know, and uh, we have to be, we have to be the educators in the room. And uh, uh, you know that tension, that tension is stronger now than it's ever been. I think. The other thing I will mention is very much in recent years, and related to this, is the emphasis, particularly at the undergraduate level, on the quality of student life and the role of the university in ensuring that quality. So it is the university's business to make sure students um, uh, don't uh, engage in binge drinking and hurt themselves. It is the university's business to make sure that they are not uh, engaged in non-consensual act sexual activities with each other. It is the university's business to uh, maintain a campus culture 
that uh, 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 would benefit our students' education. And some, that's okay, I accept those challenges. Again, we're educators, I think we have to accept those challenges. But at the same time, we have to be partners with the student community in doing that. You know, we, we um, you know, there was a time when, you know, uh, uh, in, in loco parentis meant the university embraced a parental role. I think in the 60s and 70s, in the period where I was a college student, universities backed away from that role, and I was glad they did. Uh, but now we're, I think we're, we're grappling toward what is our role. Nobody wants, uh, you know, uh, rules about student conduct, about who can be in whose room at what time, and that, again. Uh, but probably the laissez-faire of the 60s and 70s isn't, we're finding it's not working. Our students come to us with different experiences with different socialization, with different backgrounds, with different psyches, and uh, many of them are not quite ready for uh, the hands-off experience of the late 60s and 70s. And uh, so what is our role? I think we're in the middle, we're living that right now. It's changing as we, mm -hmm. as we speak. And I, I think first and foremost, we have to embrace our, our, our lives as educators in answering those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of things that you've just touched on that are, are related to concerns I've heard expressed um, by other educators, um, often expressed as a sense of crisis, which I'm not fully expecting you to share. Yeah. But, but, I mean, clearly you're grappling with a lot of the same things that people are pointing to. One, you know, is the model sustainable with, with spiraling tuition costs and with the pressure on families and with the uh, at least seemingly diminishing returns of higher education, yeah. at least in the perception of that? You know, is it a sustainable model as, as the public sphere kind of backs off of education and, and others are kind of patching things together as they can? That's one of the kind of nodes of a sense of crisis, but then that the fallout from that creates 10 others, as yeah, you know, exactly. the crisis for the humanities, yeah, the yeah. sense of a kind of whittled down idealism of the university as a place where uh, we can uh, kind of revel in the useless, yeah, in, in yeah. very useful ways, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, I, think uh, I, I don't think we're in crisis. I do think higher education is changing, and I do think the pressures on higher education are more obvious now than they've been in the past. Um, and th there's lots, th there's lots of them. I think first and foremost, we have to recognize we, we just went through the, the biggest recession since the Great Depression, and recessions create a focus on a kind of uh, kind of cost benefit thinking, short term cost benefit thinking about higher education, uh, and nowhere is that more obvious than in the incredible anxiety our students have matched only by the anxiety of their parents about employment after college. And uh, the reality is our students do get jobs. Uh, they don't always get the jobs they want, and, and they do end up making a living. But I think we have to be careful. I am, ha I am happy to talk about the college premium, the, the additional earnings that a, students will make, a student will make if they go to college. Uh, I'm happy to talk about the ways in which Yale can help you achieve your aspirations, whatever they are, beyond college. But I also think we can emphasize all that too much. We can create a sense in our students that the purpose of college is employment post-college as opposed to the experience of college itself. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I often talk to students who want to uh, who imagine what they'd love to do after college is I want to go out to Silicon Valley and join the tech world and uh, you know be, be, a, uh, be, be an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, and I hope what will happen is I'll invent something, some gizmo that will be attractive to Apple or Google or whatever. They'll buy it and they'll make me a very wealthy person. And I often talk about, if that's what you want to do, I want you to think about your Yale education. I want to think about what you, you know, Yale, Yale is very proud of the fact that our commitment to the humanities and to the general skills that a liberal education provides, learning how to communicate, learning how to think critically, learning how to entertain contradictory thoughts, learning how to think in a more complex way, uh, learning how to work in teams, learning how to uh, uh, write, you know. Um, I want you to think about all of that. 
because I think those are the perfect skills for what you want to do, I tell that student. Because you're going to do it in a different way. You're not, you're going to go out and you're going to build something of lasting value. You're going to build uh, a, maybe a company that will employ other people, that will lift other people, uh, that will uh, uh, constantly evolve to do new things as the world changes, uh, that will not be just about inventing the next gizmo and selling it off, mm -hmm. but will build a team of people working to accomplish something for the long term. And you will still be an entrepreneur in doing that. And so I, I, I guess what I'm really saying is I think sometimes the, the dialectics are drawn to in two oppositional ways. I think you can take a great humanities education, let's say, at a place like Yale College, let's say, uh, and, and have as your goal, I want to be an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, and your education will be directly relevant to that, that aspiration. Um, not only that, I would argue, it might give you, a comp give you an advantage over someone whose education focused more narrowly on just the technical skills. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, now, why do we feel we have, why do we feel that students are walking away from the humanities and, and sometimes we feel we're in crisis or whatever? I don't think we've made this case strongly enough. I don't think we've, you know, I, I think, right. you know, well, entice the student in and then you've salt bought them, yeah. you know. As I mentioned, I, know, I thought I was going to college to be a, probably be a chemistry major. I ended up a psychology major, but I wanted it. I wanted to do a theater major too, and and all essentially did the equivalent of a theater minor, you uh -huh, know, uh -huh. and took poetry and took history and you know had a great had a great experience doing all of that. I think our I, I just don't see it as um, uh, either or. Right, right. Um, to come back to, to two of the points that you just made, some of the people who I've interviewed and at this point, um, I've interviewed a couple of deans. I've interviewed not here, but not in the region, uh, a couple of faculty members. Um, two things you just said. One is when you were talking about the commodification and the kind of the drift towards commodification of education. Um, some of the folks that I've interviewed would say or have said that, that universities have become kind of complicit in that, both in the way that they market education um, and in the way that they package some of their own practices. Um, another point that you just made about um, post-crash and that the, the, um, the power of the recession and kind of orienting people to think in a particular way about education and cost-benefit. Um, Andrew Ross, for example, at, at NYU would say the, the crash just laid bare something that was already in place and the universities have been kind of drifting in a cost-benefit direction for three decades at that point. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? So um, there is no doubt that the pressure, let me say it a different way. We, I certainly want the most deserving, interesting, diverse group of students that we can admit to come here. That, many members of that group are gonna be attractive to, attracted to other places too. And so I think we do feel the pressure to help them figure out that Yale is a good fit and attract them here. I think sometimes that you know, that focus on what the admissions people call yield leads to a kind of um, gilding of lilies and leads to, you know, the, those examples that in the media look so outrageous, the, you know, who has the best climbing wall or the poshest, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, bedrooms or the best food. And... On the one hand, I don't mind trying to make college attractive to students. But that's not where I want to be investing what money we have to invest. I want to hire the best faculty. I want to have the best resources we could possibly have for research and scholarship. And I want to innovate in our teaching. And, you know, it is a sum zero budget. You have a certain amount you can spend every year. And I want to think hard before we gild lilies when we could be investing in, in our core mission, improving scholarship, improving teaching. And so, um, I, yes, I, you know, I wouldn't disagree that those pressures are there. What's creating them? I think, I think, 
I don't know that it originated with colleges and universities, uh, but I think we are we, we fall susceptible to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I would point one finger. There's probably many fingers one can point, but you know, one finger is uh, the media that perpetuates this endless focus on ratings and, and rankings, rankings and, right? Where they have convinced the American public, well, now the international public that there are three, four, five places worth going to in, you know, American higher education, I, I believe there's about 35 college, 3,500 colleges and universities in the U.S., number like that. There is no way that only three or four or five of them are worth going to. And yet the focus on rankings right, sort of creates that expectations in students. So here's the, you know, here's the, the paradox of it. In, when I applied to colleges, places like Yale, I think had received about six, 7,000 applications and admitted about 25% of them, maybe 8,000 applications. When uh, now it's 31,000 and we're admitting six or 7% of them. The paradox is, and yet we're working harder to attract those ones we admit here and we're gilding lilies and such. You know, why, why is it when there's such demand? What I would say is, I wouldn't call it a crisis, but I would say the challenge is that um, we've scrambled up the natural processes that would allow students to find the university or college, the place in higher education that best fits their interests, their personal styles, their, um, uh, the level at which they can uh, perform intellectually, um, and uh, we've scrambled that all up and focused them on too narrow a range of places and convinced them that they'll only be happy if right. they go to just a narrow range. And then we've convinced ourselves and then that they'll only choose yeah, us right. if we compete for it. So does the social psychologist in you say that this is something that's just it's kind of embedded in the culture of the last few decades? Yeah, I and think it's, it is. It's not the university, it but it's the culture. It's the privatization and the, the kind of sense of... Um, well, that kind of pulling back from the, the idea of a common wheel and a public sphere and trying to get the best for yourself and your I, kids. I think, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's all true. Uh, I think I, I, would not, I would not say that universities are not complicit. I think they may not have been knowingly complicit. That is, I think we may, you know, the whole idea of culture is, is you, know, you, you know, you're a fish who doesn't know the water's wet. I mean, it, it, it happens, it is a product of human behavior and human, the human mind but it is transcendent, it is an emergent property. You can't, as an individual, it's very hard to change it. Uh, you know. And so, um, uh, yes, I think, mm -hmm. I think that's true. Um, I think, so what do we do? I think we have to constantly refocus uh, our students on the good of the community, on giving, what, what, however you want to frame it, whatever your metaphor is whether it's you know, giving back, which has a little bit of a noblesse oblige feel to it, or it's just living a life of purpose, or you know, I'm Jewish, so I think about tikkun olam, you know, our, our purpose, we're put, you know, I, I'm not a particularly per, a person with a lot of faith, but I am a person who does believe we have a purpose in life, and it's to uh, improve the world, to leave the world a better place than we found it when we entered it. Uh, you know, and, 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 and to raise that, those as the aspirations of, our, of our, our students, too. Can you do that by being a, uh, uh, you know, a uh, individual entrepreneur starting a business? Sure you can. You're going to create jobs for other people. You're going to hopefully create products that have a, you know, that uh, whether it's saving uh, steps or, you know, or... Um, leading to happiness or just creating a better life for more people, whatever it is, sure you can. Are there ways to do any of these things that don't contribute to a better world? That's true too. And, you know, you can run a non-profit NGO that damages the world and you can do, I think, entrepreneurism in a cynical way that enriches yourselves, but yourself but not very much else. So, you know, I... I, I yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I think there are ways to do this, and I think helping our students discover them is partly our, our role. Uh -huh.
I want to come back to something you said way at the beginning when you were describing your own trajectory. You, you very much narrate your own move from the faculty to the dean's office in terms of the opportunities available to you as an educator, so that, that being a dean was just another way of being an educator. Yeah. Um, still feel that? I do still feel that. Office? You know, I, uh, about a year ago, maybe it was two, at a, um, a dinner for parents of Yale undergraduates uh, that we were hosting during family weekend. Um, I, I, I don't remember what it was I said, but I started a sentence by saying, as an educator, I, and at the end of the evening, one of the parents came up to me and said, I can't believe how wonderful it was to hear you use such quaint language. And, and it just, <laughs> well, it, see, it, which is part of the reason I asked the yeah, question. It because... surprised me, actually, that people find that kind of quaint. And, and I know why they find it kind of quaint now. I think, well, you, you know, know. We, we, you know, recessions and in general the culture of rankings and ratings that transcend the recession do create a focus on the business of the university rather than the calling of the university. Right, and certainly among faculty, and you know this, yeah. there is this sense that there's a divide and that once you cross over it, you have, you in a sense, and I, you've I, ceased, I, you've again, ceased to be an educator. Again, I think it's too bright a line. Right, no, I uh, I think, you know, there is... There is a business side to higher education. I mean, I you know, I want to, I want to have the resources to employ as many wonderful professors as we can. Uh, you know, I want to have the resources to educate as many students as we can. And uh, you know, when when you when you look at Yale, that business model is actually the organizational model is very complicated, but the business model isn't, right? We. It costs three billion dollars a year to run Yale. One of those billions comes from our endowment, right? One of those billions comes from a little more than one of those billions comes from uh, the 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 uh, revenues generated by grant and contract grants and contracts to to support research and clinical work conducted by our medical school faculty. That's the second billion. Mm -hmm. The third billion is everything else. Mm -hmm. And um, um, a piece of that is tuition, but not a big one. Right. And, uh, but, you know, it's ticket sales at football games or, you know, selling things with the word yell on them. And, right? It's everything else. It's everything else. And if your goal is a more accessible yell where we can offer a great education to a broader array of students, you can't do that. You can't accomplish that goal without paying attention to the business side. Right. And so, um, uh, but as soon as we get into the what, what the it is, that the business side will enable, now I'm an educator again. Right. And I think you're walking both sides of that line mm -hmm. uh, uh, every day. When you, um, having, I mean, especially your years in the provost's office, um, but pretty much since then as well, you've gotten to know the guts of this university as well as anyone. Um, when you and I arrived here, you got here a little bit before me, but the endowment was about two billion at yeah. tops, yeah, right? Yeah. How do you understand that scale from two billion to whatever you know? Where a couple, we'll probably uh, be around uh, our June thirtieth. June thirtieth is where we close every year, and that close will probably be over twenty three billion. That's what that's the number I was going to say. Yeah, but and, uh, so how how do we understand? How do we get our minds around what has changed in the university? I mean, and not just this one, but yeah. in, in the, the universe of higher education that explains the jump from 2 to 23 yeah, yeah. with a kind of a sense of not necessarily scarcity, but... Um, yeah. Well, you know, it, it is true. And the, pe the people who talk about crisis in higher education do talk about the cost of higher education, which has risen more quickly than inflation. Um, some of that is because universities are very complicated. Uh, some of that is because the culture values relationships, values community uh, ahead of what the business types would call efficiency. Um, some of that is just because doing things with high quality that are complicated cost money to do it. So there's no doubt it costs more. Now, at a place like Yale, you can pass that on to your students, but I would feel that we would be working against 
our stated goal of accessibility if we do that. And so to not pass that on to students, you are passing it on to wealthy students by, by you know, tuition, room, and board fees that rise faster than uh, um, uh, inflation. But if you don't want to pass those costs on to students who can not afford them, essentially to upper middle, middle, and working class students, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So just to, to scale it, the amount of money we spend on financial aid in Yale College, just in Yale College, is about the same as the amount of money we spend paying the uh, latter faculty of Yale College. Right? So that's a big number, you know, right? right? You could hire an entire faculty for your financial aid budget. To do that requires money. Now, where are you going to get that money? Um, mostly, well, let me do the most in a minute. Uh, the agencies that provide grant and contract income for scholarship are not growing their budgets. The, we've already decided that the fees and tuition, you know, that it's a limit to how much of that you can raise. So really the place, the only place you can look to to provide more and more of that income is uh, gifts from donors that are then invested and turned into growth in your endowment. Um, we are right now, as I said, approximately a third of our budget is from the endowment. A place like Princeton, it's even higher, but a public university is far lower. The, uh, as the, st the state, you know, in the old days, think of it as, think of the endowment spending as the part that the state would provide a great state university. So I don't know what the number was, but I would bet 30, 25 years ago, a university like Berkeley or UCLA or a SUNY campus received about 30% of its budget from the state. Mm -hmm. Now those numbers are far lower. UConn, I think it's 20%. But you go to places like uh, uh, you know, some of the Western states, it's down 5 10%. Um, you know, for Yale, it's zero. And that, that 25 30% that you would have gotten, is, we're getting from our endowment. So, so I don't think there's anything uh, overly mysterious about it. it, it, it you know, it's the part that a great private university is going to... Right. And yet, you know, so... If, now, how did it grow so much? Yeah, so that's... It's, the, you know, a combination of gifts and aggressive fundraising, which all private universities are involved in and increasingly public universities are involved in. Mm -hmm. A certain amount of the experience that students have while they're on... You know, our biggest givers are by far our alumni. Uh, we, we raise far less money from corporate or foundation world. Uh, you know, it's... It's our alumni. That's who our, our bread and butter givers are. Um, you want them to have had an educational experience on this campus that leads them to then want to give back if they have the means to do it. Uh, and then it's investing those gifts. Uh, and, and, you know, those gifts are invested in uh, the, the portfolio of investments that pension funds all now invest in and virtually all you know, universities invest in. Uh, which is less and less publicly traded stocks and bonds and more and more private equity and real estate and hedge funds and even some commodities. Um, the, the goal is not to tie, is to tie the future of your endowment to um, assets that don't, whose rise and fall don't necessarily correlate with each other. Unfortunately, the re Great Recession of 2008 uh, and 9 showed us that when things really fall apart, they are correlated. Mm -hmm. And that's why endowment lost a lot. Uh -huh. Of course, it's why, it, it, you know, uh, it's why recovery is kind of lumpy and bumpy. Mm -hmm. To go back to the other side of the ledger for a minute, if you were to look at the operating costs at Yale, say, 1994 against... 2014, what are the numbers that are going to just jump off the yeah, page in yeah. terms of where the growth has been? It's really interesting. So we're doing that study right now. We're doing, uh, so our current budget system was implemented in 2001. So we have great data for 2001, let's say about ha seven years later, 2007, seven years later, 2014. And uh, actually uh, preparing that study, we're preparing that study now, it will be done in October. Um, I, there's, it's interesting, you know, um, 
we spend a lot more on safety and security. We spend a lot, a lot more responding to regulation. Now, you know, I'm not one of these people who on the grants, grants and contracts. And everything, research regulation, student conduct regulation, right? So, uh, a good example is uh, there were two or three lawyers in the in the general counsel's office when I uh, came to Yale in 1981. There's more than 20 now. You know, they're busy people and they're mostly responding from things from the outside that impinge on Yale. I don't think anybody would have predicted that. Um, I think trying to recruit the very best faculty, or the very best faculty are identified in lots of different places. It costs more than it used to. There's a, what's very, you know, here again, you know, traditional economics doesn't explain it very well. There's lots of PhDs being produced, but you want the very best. And, I, you know, almost every time we're recruiting faculty, either Princeton or Harvard or Stanford or Chicago is also recruiting the very same person. And so it's, it's a constrained market. That drives up costs. Um, we deferred, maybe Yale, that's general in higher education. Yale had a specific problem with buildings. We were an old campus that hadn't properly maintained its buildings. So two big costs of the budget were catching up with simply getting our buildings up to uh, code and um, not essentially not to crumble to the ground. We're not done with that. But then also reserving funds out of our operating budget every year um, to the tune of a couple hundred million dollars, a little under $200 million, to create a fund that we can then spend on keeping our, we spend about that much. We, sp we, we raise the fund and spend it every year. Right, without breaking it's kind of like a Ponzi, <laughs> right, yeah. Ponzi scheme. But, uh, you know, but for maintaining our buildings, you know, for Yale, that, you can really see that when you do these uh, studies. Um, you know, buildings, financial aid, personnel costs all rose faster than inflation. And then I would say the parts of the university that deal with a far more complicated regulatory uh, environment. I, I don't say that because I'm one of these knee-jerk anti-regulation people at all. You know, I'm not, you know, uh, I don't have those political attitudes. But we really have, we now we have a network of overlapping and often contradictory regulatory behaviors. Even the ones we're dealing with right now, Cleary, which is reporting requirements around crime on campus, and Title IX, which is reporting requirements and adjudication requirements and prevention requirements having to do with uh, sexual misconduct, they are not actually always congruent, what Cleary requires and what Title IX requires. So, you know, it's just layered and layered. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's a, a group now um, that's very, in the Obama administration, that's actually very interested in figuring out whether um, simplifying regulatory climate and burden might be a way of freeing up more funds that can then be given to students and their families. What's nice about that idea is that the left and the right could get together on this. Mm -hmm. So somebody like Senator Grassley says, um, you know, is probably more cynical about regulation uh, being on the right and is very concerned with universities should use their assets to give back to families. Well, you know, great. On the left, um, we can get behind, um, you know, how do we, how do we channel uh, 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 assets that might have been spent on regulation uh, into, uh, that might be politically driven, into um, something that's going to help society, something that's going to lift boats, something that's going to make Yale more accessible. You, you know, I, I actually think when we get past this gridlock uh, in Congress, you could actually get bipartisan support for ideas like that. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you want colleges and universities to be spending their money on? Is it really uh, layers and layers of regulation, animal research, human research? Um, uh, you know, what we eat, what we, you know, and everything. Mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot, and a certain amount of it, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I, you know, I support what we're trying to do with Title IX now to reduce sexual misconduct on campus. I support crime, reporting crime. I, su you know, I support all these things. But they're probably, we've created uh, ways of doing it that are just very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. Need to think that through. And mm -hmm. then save some money and shift it 
to supporting our core mission, scholarship and teaching. Right. You know? right. Last piece of this I wanted to talk to you about, I'm kind of looking ahead, looking to the future. Um, well, first, I mean, in, a, in the broadest sense, I'd be curious um, what you think the American university is going to look like 25 years from now. But, uh, but also, especially, and especially for graduate students who will be listening to this, um, around questions of academic labor. Um, tenure is under assault in various ways, in various places. Yeah, yeah. Casualization is on the rise, not so much on this campus, yes. but nationwide, yeah. pretty dramatically. Yeah. Um, what, where are we headed in those Yeah, terms? so, so uh, it's a very complicated question, and uh, let me give a short answer, because we're out of time, uh, not because I wouldn't want to engage this uh, more. First of all, I, I do see the proportion of teaching that is done you know, uh, by part-time. Out, not, not so much at Yale. Yale, I think, has been pretty true to the, the, the idea of scholar teachers. Um, uh, but, I, but I do see it as problematic uh, and um, uh, quite worrisome. Um, I do think we should support great teaching wherever we find it. And sometimes that's going to be off the ladder. But I think we want to th- that needs to be thoughtful and not, pri- and not motivated primarily by the economics of it. You know, we already do that. You know, the, the, some of the great language teachers are not latter faculty. Some of the great teaching of lower level mathematics calculus courses are not latter faculty. That's okay. I think we can create that kind of a faculty with great benefits, with job security, with longer term cont- contracts, with opportunities for professional development leaves. You know, you can do that right. So again, you don't want to draw the line too brightly. Uh, uh, but I, but I am I am nervous about short term, right? And and why am I nervous about that? Well, those are, you know I, I think that's a tough way to make a living for a scholar. But I also think it's not offering, uh, con, you know, what in medicine you would call continuity of care. That is, you want students to be advised and mentored over time. It requires relationship building. It's more than just dropping into a classroom, teaching them, and disappearing. Um, I think what we do in a classroom is going to look different 25 years from now than now. We're going to, we are going to, you know, I, I think we are going to f- have less formal lecturing. We are going to flip that, turn that into, use technology to turn that into homework. But I think as educators, we are all still going to be in the classroom. We're going to just be doing different kinds of things, much more active collaboration with our students. You know, I taught intro psych behind a podium. I wouldn't teach it that way even now. But I would. But the need for me to teach intro psych would still be there. In fact, I'd probably want to teach it in smaller groups and, and in, a, in a more engaged way. Which, uh, so, so, do I think the jobs are going to disappear? No. Do I think they're going to change? Yes. Uh, I know I have to get on the phone. Yeah. Um, but uh, so this is a bi- uh, another bigger issue. Uh, I'm more optimistic. I think we're in a moment of transition, and that's why the system is being stressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I hope we'll come out the other side in the right way. I think the very best universities will. The question is, where will? There's 30, as I said, if there, if there are 35 colleges and universities, and you know, wh- where will many of them come out? And I am concerned about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Matt. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Matt.